behalf of our faculty board, it is a privilege, a real privilege, to welcome you all, colleagues, students, members of the councils of advice, alumni, and all other interested parties to the arts lecture. We are pleased that we can start the new year on campus as it should be. I would like to extend a warm welcome to the first year students starting their studies at our faculty. We wish them lots of success with the start of their education here. In addition, and not in the last place, I would like to extend a very special welcome to Iris de Graaf, speaker of this year's lecture. I would like to congratulate you on being awarded the University of Groningen Alumnus of the Year 2022. Iris's work took on a new dimension early 2022. The impact of this was also felt in our own faculty, as it became clear during a solidarity meeting organized together with staff members. Ukrainians also work and study at our faculty. It must be unimaginably more difficult for them than for us to witness the horrors in their homeland from afar, as they fear for the fate of their loved ones. Also, Russian students and staff members follow developments in their own country with great concern. As a faculty and university, we endeavor to support those affected in various ways. These contributions demonstrated the importance of the humanities to society. This importance lies in the crucial knowledge we provide for analyzing and solving social issues. More often, this occurs in collaboration with societal partners and researchers from different fields. Today, Iris will share her insights on, within this context, the importance of maintaining the connection with an isolated country through language, compassion, and sharing the stories of those who have lost their voice. As indicated, this is an interactive uh, lecture supervised by moderator Franca de Haan. But before that, we are first curious about the story of Iris. So without further ado, Iris, might I invent invite you to the lecture. And a big applause. Thank you so much for the beautiful introduction, first of all. I feel very honored to be here today. It's very strange standing here on this side of the stage. I remember being a student myself and sitting uh, there. For those that have no clue who I am or just maybe recognize uh, some of this uh, work from NOS or Newsier, I uh, thought I'd share a little bit something about myself and my connection to the university in Groningen here. I have a Russian grandmother and a half-Russian mother who have always fascinated me. I was fascinated by her life story, by the Matryoshka dolls. And so I started uh, studying Slavonic languages and cultures here in Groningen. Afterwards, I did a master here, media and journalism, and the combination of that somehow led me to becoming a Russia correspondent. And I started working in Russia, I started during the COVID pandemic. We had closed borders, there was a lot of repression going on in that first year, a total crackdown on all opposition, NGOs, independent press, uh, there were for example, one of my first stories was the Navalny demonstrations. We traveled to Nizhny Novgorod. There were demonstrations, tens and thousands of Russians protesting on the streets, and we made a, a report. And I don't know, I see my editor in chief, former editor in chief, Marcel Gelauf, if he remembers, but that was my first report, and I was arrested because the police thought that I was one of the demonstrators. So they took me into a police van, and uh, I was like, okay, welcome to Russia, and this is my life right now. Basically, there is no more journalism these days in Russia. We work under very harsh conditions, on which I will talk about later. I left Russia uh, in March because we didn't know how to keep our team safe, how to keep our sources safe. We still don't know how to do that, but I went back because we all agreed, and I feel like we need to share the voices of the people there. Before I continue, I want to ask, is there anyone in this audience that is thinking about becoming a journalist or a correspondent? 
Oh, that's quite a lot. I'm impressed. Well, uh, at the end of this lecture, I hope that you will all be motivated because I just want to share today how important it is that we keep being journalists and that we keep reporting from these kind of countries. So how can we keep sharing stories these days? How can we keep a connection to an isolated and unfree country? A 2018 poll by the independent Levada Center Institute, it showed that half of the Russians believe what the state TV tells them. And the image of the world that most Russians have these days is what the television still tells them. Most Russians have no clue what is going on, still in Ukraine. They consider uh, it a special military operation to liberate the Ukrainian people. And, and they consider all information from the West, so the information that we get, as Western propaganda and lies, which is quite difficult. This effect of this, this worldview that people get, you can see it pretty well when you interview people on the street. So this shows pretty well also the generational gap that we see in Russia. So the elder generation mostly believes state TV, the younger generation who was brought up with Russian, with the Western media and social media kind of has a more nuanced uh, worldview. And you see that right now uh, destroying a lot of families in Russia. So social research is dead. Academic research, historical research is dead. Um, it is forbidden. Many academics have fled in the past months from Russia. They are no longer allowed to do independent research. It is forbidden to research something political or historically incorrect, according to Russia. Um, you see that history is being rewritten. School books for children in schools are being rewritten. They are now uh, edited and censored. Children learn about the Nazis, so-called, in Ukraine. They need to wave the Russian flag before they start their class. They need to wear the big Z sign in support of the operation. And one example for me that illustrated this crackdown on academics and history very well was the ban and closure of Memorial. And Memorial is a very old and respected human rights organization in Russia that collected uh, all the history about Soviet repression and they published it in exhibitions and in books and they, well, they basically they kept the memory of repression alive. How can we report if social research is no longer reliable? And how can we report about the current events if you don't have the historical context to place them in, right? How can we do our jobs? That is the biggest struggle for all of us nowadays in Russia. But I feel like nowadays as a Russia correspondent, the most important part is to give people a voice. So that's what we've been trying to do. We need to keep talking to each other, that we need to learn each other's languages, that we need to hear to each other's stories. And we need to keep sharing these stories of how the average Russian thinks, right? Who watches only state propaganda, but also of young Russians who do want to speak out and their voices should be heard. And these brave people are actually the reason why I went back and why I am still in Russia. I feel like it's my responsibility to continue to share these voices. I hope that this um, yeah, gives us all a little moment to reflect on the freedom we have here, how much we can appreciate that we can study openly, freely, that we can have an open debate. And I think we should always keep fighting for that. So stay resilient, be brave, and have a beautiful academic year. Thank you very much. We have a lot of uh, opportunity here to ask you some questions. Uh, I also received some questions uh, through email that I would like to ask you from other students. We see a lot of difficulties in your work. I mean, choosing your words very wisely, having to leave your phone behind, getting arrested on your first actual report. Right. Was there ever a moment where you thought, what am I doing here? These are things that you don't really expect. When you start a job as a correspondent, of course, you know a little something about Russia, but I got this job before the COVID pandemic started, so it was actually quite a different Russia back then. For example, yesterday, colleague Ivan Sofranov was put 22 years in jail for his journalistic research, independent research. And in moments like these, you think, what am I doing here? But then I try to remember why I chose this job and what I just wanted to share with you guys, how important I think it is that we are actually on the ground, even if you cannot speak as freely as before, even if you cannot travel as freely as you want, even if you don't have that many people speaking to you. I think it's important to 
keep doing something there. But also, uh, you mentioned cutting family ties even because of um, some uncles, I believe, think yeah. you're spreading fake news. So it also gets quite personal. Yes, for sure. Well, it's not only my Ukrainian of uh, my Russian family; it's also Ukrainian friends. I uh, I actually spent some time in Kiev before I became a Russian correspondent, and I have a very good friend there who doesn't want to talk to me anymore because I am in Russia. So it really breaks a lot of ties. We try, of course, to talk to our family. Like that's not the full picture. Here are some Western news sources. In the end, you know what can you do? People are very convinced of their own worldview, and I feel like they also don't want to believe what we see. Uh, Marije Michel, Chair of Language Learning here for European Languages and Cultures. Thank you very much for your uh, yeah, impressive talk. Thank you. Um, I have a question because we do see that some of our students have a hard time sometimes explaining why they study a language. And probably now we also see that some students find it difficult to say that they are studying Russian. Right. So what is your answer to that? Or what, what is your inspiration to the students in here to say, actually, you're ex doing an excellent job and please continue? And what does language and the knowledge of Russian mean for you and your job? Well, first of all, I would have to say that I hope that we are nowadays not only studying Russian language anymore, like it was in my uh, study, but also Ukrainian, Belarusian, you know, that we include more um, Slavonic languages, actually, also in European cultures and uh, languages. Um, I think that's very important. Like I just mentioned, being in Russia, it gives a lot of backlash from society because people are like, why are you there? And are you not legitimizing what is happening? Or why are you still living in this country and that's very difficult for me as well I think for these students as well how do you justify or justify how do you even talk normally about that you just want to study something because you're fascinated or that you are working somewhere because you think it's important but I think that it doesn't help if we are all isolated I think it's more important than ever that we have people trying to understand what is going on there in any uh, type of I don't know, sector, you know, economy-wise, sanctions, uh, uh, climate change. We need some people who speak the language. I think they should say that. Hi, my name is uh, Robin and I'm a student, a master's student in Middle Eastern Studies. And my question for you is if you have any advice, if you can think of anything for someone who wants to become a, a future correspondent possibly. And secondly, uh, for someone who uh, will maybe work in a repressive country, and how do you deal with that? I think it's very important that you will try to do it. As far as working in a specific country or area, I think the most important thing is that you specialize in the language. It's a huge uh, pro plus, so to say, if you speak a uh, local language, especially a language that not many people speak, it really helps you a lot. Do everything, like film, edit, make sure you know radio, online, TV, because for us young journalists, we need to be multimedia skilled, so to say, so that's important. And mostly when you go to a country, a, a repressive country, um, just think that there are always ways to do your job. And yes, it might not be so easy, and sometimes you might feel intimidated, but m for me myself, I thought it would be very scary, but I also feel like it makes me a little bit rebellious in a way, like, you cannot stop me, you know? And I think if, you've, if you're there, you will feel that you are actually, uh, well, not specifically braver, but that you can do it. And that there are always some kind of, I mean, we made these stories, you know, in current day Russia, it's crazy that it, uh, it but it's possible. So there are always ways, I think, to do something. And it brings a lot, I mean, look where I am today, it's very special. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we'll keep it in mind. <laughs> Thank you. I think that's a great way to end up this uh, arts lecture, this letter lazing. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for coming and taking the time to listen as well. <laughs> Give her a big round of applause. <laughs> thank you. We all want to thank you, Iris, very, very much for your talk, for answering so honestly all our questions. Franka, uh, thank you also very much for moderating the discussion for asking very good questions. And give her a big applause again, please. And also for Franca. Franca, Franca thank you very much. <laughs>